So I'm going to admit, first off, that this talk is nothing if not self-indulgent. And the reason I chose to do um, a talk about literature and math um, and writing in general, I guess literature is probably not even my thing, but um, was because I'm now moving into a state in my life where I'm going to be doing a lot less math and I'm going to be doing a lot more writing. So I actually got accepted into an MFA program for creative writing in Oklahoma. So I will be moving in the fall to do that. And I wanted to give one more talk uh, here because honestly, you guys are my favorite audience. Um, I've given presentations at other places and this just is my favorite thing. Um, and uh, kind of commemorate that for myself and share a little bit of what I've been working on in one of my writing classes. So um, basically what we'll be doing is looking at several different examples of um, mathematical analogy in literature. Uh, it's going to be across several genres. I'm going to start out with fiction, move on to a little bit of poetry, and then go toward, toward nonfiction near the end, um, because my essay is a creative nonfiction piece. Um, most of this talk will actually be me reading, um, which is why I have this set up here. I'm kind of going for that like librarian reading um, to children vibe, not to be patronizing at all, but um, well, you are. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I wanted to say I'm, I'm going to be doing a lot of reading during this talk. Uh, I recorded it. It's about 30 minutes of reading, meaning that I'll be only talking off the cuff for about 15 minutes total, which might be difficult for me as I can talk quite a bit. Um, so my first uh, example is this lovely little book. Um, I read this near the beginning of the year, and it's actually one of my favorite things that I've ever read. So I will highly recommend this. I'm going to start out reading. I didn't test getting into this chair. It's doable. Just the first page of this, um, and then I'll talk a little bit more about it. We called him the professor, and he called my son Root because he said the flat top of his head reminded him of the square root sign. There's a fine brain in there, the professor said, mussing my son's hair. Root, who wore a cap to avoid being teased by his friends, gave a wary shrug. With this one little sign, we can come to know a, an infinite range of numbers, even those we can't see. He traced the symbol in a thick layer of dust on his desk. So I uh, broke from the color scheme because how pretty. Um, I just wanted to give a quick book synopsis, and then I'll be reading more sections from this. Um, so there's three major characters, and the, the book really centers around these three. Um, the housekeeper, the professor, and, the, and Root. None of them are given their actual names, um, which was an interesting choice. But the housekeeper essentially is hired to take care of this professor who 15 years prior um, uh, had an accident that caused him to only have an 80 minute episodic memory. But he can still remember all of the math. So he essentially uses that to connect with the people in his life because he doesn't really remember anything else about them. Um, and then uh, like the professor, the author uses math to connect with the reader as well um, and to show some of the characterization um, of, of these characters, especially the housekeeper and Root, um, which we'll see as I read some more sections. So this one I'm going to have to get on the whiteboard for a little bit of it because I don't really want to read out lists of numbers. I'll be doing that later with my own essay. Um, so at the beginning um, of meeting the housekeeper, the professor asks for her... Um, her birth date, um, and then tries to make a connection. Your birthday is February 20th, 220. Can I show you something? This was a prize I won for my thesis on transcendent, uh, transcendent number theory when I was in, at college. He took off his wristwatch and held it up for me to see. It was a stylish foreign br brand, quite out of keeping with the professor's rumpled, rumpled appearance. It's a wonderful prize, I said, but can you see the number engraved here? The inscription on the back of the case read President's Prize number 284. Does that mean it was the 284th prize awarded? I suppose so, but the interesting part is the number 284 itself. Take a break from the dishes for a moment and think about these two numbers, 220 and 284. Do they mean anything to you? Pulling me by my apron strings, he sat me down at the table and produced a pencil stub from his pocket. On the back of an advertising insert, he wrote the two numbers separated strangely on the card. Well, what do you make of them? I wiped my hands on my apron, feeling awkward as the professor looked at me expectantly. I wanted to respond, but had no idea what sort of answer would please a mathematician. To me, they were just numbers. Well, I stammered, I suppose you could say they're both three different digit numbers. 
And they're fairly similar in size. For example, if I were in the meat section at the supermarket, there'd be very little difference between a package of sausage that weighed 220 grams and one that weighed 284. They're so close that I would just buy the one that was fresher. They seem pretty much the same. They're both in the 200s and they're both even. Good, he almost shouted, shaking the leather strap of his watch. I didn't know what to say. It's important to use your intuition. You swoop down on the numbers like a kingfisher catching a glint of sunlight on the fish's fin. He pulled up a chair as if wanting to be closer to the numbers. The musty paper smell from the study clung to the professor. You know, does, you know what a factor is, don't you? And he went on, and uh, to take quite a track over here to this side of the room for some whiteboard space, to factor the two numbers. This one has a lot of factors, actually. Um, well, it looks like that's actually supposed to be for this part. And then he added them up. And um, actually, it looks like the, or the housekeeper added them up and said, there, I'm done. That's right. The sum of the factors of 220 is 284, and the sum of the factors of 284 is 220. They're called amicable numbers, and they're extremely rare. Fermat and Descartes were only able to find one pair each. They're linked to each other by some divine scheme, and how incredible that your birthday and this number on my watch should be just a pair. We sat staring at the advertisement for a long time. With my finger, I traced the trail of numbers from the ones the professor had written to the ones I'd added, and they all seemed to flow together, as if we'd been connecting up the constellations in the night sky. And here's where you can see two things. One, um, the professor himself making the connection with the housekeeper, um, and also the housekeeper, who is the narrator of this book, um, and by proxy, the author making a connection with the reader. Um, Giving, going to be reading this section mainly for context for later, and partly because I like the way that it's written. Um, may I tell you something about, or may I tell you about something I discovered? I could hold, hardly believe the words that c had come out of my mouth, but the professor's hand fell still. Overcome by the beauty of his delicate patterns, perhaps I'd wanted to take part, and I was absolutely sure he would show great respect, even for the humblest discovery. The sum of the divisors of 28 is 28. Indeed, he said. And there he wrote next to his outline of the art and conjecture, um, and he wrote the factors of 28. A perfect number. Perfect number? I murmured, savoring the sound of the words. The smallest perfect number is six. Six equals one plus two plus three. Oh, then they're not so special after all. On the contrary, a number with this kind of perfection is rare indeed. After 28, the next one is 496. Um, which equals 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16 plus 31 plus 62 plus 124 plus 248. After that, you have 8,128. The next one after that is, and we start to go higher, and I'm not going to read these numbers out loud because I don't do well with that. <laughs> um, that's why I started taking more abstract math, to be quite honest. The further you go, the more difficult they are to find, though he had easily followed the trail into the billions. Naturally, the sum of the divisors of numbers other than perfect numbers are either greater or less than the numbers themselves. When the sum is greater, it's called an abundant number, and when it's less, it's a deficient number. Marvelous names, don't you think? The divisors of 18, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 6 plus 9, equal 21, so it's an abundant number. But 14 is deficient, 1 plus 2 plus 7 equals 10. I tried picturing 18 and 14, but now that I've heard, I'd heard the professor's explanation, they were no longer simply numbers. 18 secretly carried a heavy burden, while 14 fell mute in the face of its terrible black. There are lots of deficient numbers that are just one larger than the sum of their divisors, but there are no abundant numbers that are, e or that are just one smaller than the sum of theirs, or rather, no one has ever found one. Why is that? The answer is written in God's notebook, said the professor. Um, and here's where you start to also see some characterization of the housekeeper. 
Um, she has a tendency to connect with these numbers by imagining them as people, um, as you can talk about with the, the burdens. Um, and we're actually going to see a little bit of this uh, in the poetry section of this talk as well. Move on here to where we see her son, 10-year-old Root. So what do you see? He tended to begin with this sort of general question. Um, and, and here they're talking about primes that have been written out, um, all the primes between 1 and 100. They're scattered all over the place. Root usually answered first, and 2 is the only one that's even. For some reason, he always noticed the odd man out. That's a characterization of Root right there. Um, and it's not one that you get to see throughout the book for the most part, um, but you can imagine a character that might see the odd one out among people as well, um, who might be the person who approaches that kid sitting alone um, in a cafeteria. You're right, two is the only even prime. It's the leadoff batter for the infinite team of prime numbers after it. That must be awfully lonely, said Root. And he shows, again, he's like his mother as well. Don't worry, said the professor. If it gets lonely, it has lots of company with the other even numbers. But some of them come in pairs, like 17 and 19 and 41 and 43, I said, not wanting to be shown up by Root. A very astute observation, said the professor. Those are known as twin primes. I wondered why ordinary words seemed so exotic when they were used in relation to numbers. Amicable numbers or twin primes had a precise quality about them, and yet they sounded as though they'd been taken straight out of a poem. In my mind, the twins had matching outfits and stood holding hands as they waited in the number line. I'll read one last section here for now. Um, this is after a point in the book when the housekeeper has been fired. Um, Temporarily, of course, uh, and she hasn't seen the professor in a while, but she still thinks about him and she still thinks about numbers. I thought of the professor whenever I saw a prime number, which, as it turned out, was almost everywhere I looked. Price tags at the supermarket, house numbers above doors, on bus schedules, or the expiration date on a package of ham, root score on a test. On the face of it, these numbers faithfully played their official roles, but in secret they were primes, and I knew that was what gave them their true meaning. Of course, I couldn't always tell immediately whether a number was prime. Thanks to the professor, I knew the prime numbers up to 100 just by their feel, but when I encountered a larger number that I suspected might be prime, I had to divide it to be sure. There were plenty of cases where a number that looked to be composite turned out to be prime, and just as many others where I discovered divisors for a number that I was certain was prime. Taking my cue from the professor, I started carrying a pencil and a notebook pad around in the pocket of my apron. That way, I could do my calculations whenever the mood struck. One day, while I was cleaning in the kitchen in a tax consultant's house, I found a serial number engraved on the back of the refrigerator door, 2311. It looked intriguing, so I took out my notepad, moved aside the detergent and rags, and set to work. I tried three, then seven, and then 11, all to no avail. They all left a remainder of one. Next, I tried 13 and 17 and 19, but none of them was a divisor. There was no way to break up 2,311, but more than that, its indivisibility was possibly, er, positively devious. Every time I thought I had spotted a divisor, the numbers seemed to slip away, leaving me oddly exhausted, yet all the more eager for the hunt, which was always the way with primes. Um, and I think one thing that I love about this book is that it shows not only connections among the characters, but also um, somebody learning to love math. Um, in much the same way that I did, I believe. So I will move on from the fiction. Um, and there is a, I'm not even sure if I would call it an article or a poetry collection or some combination of both. It has an abstract, so of course it's very professional. Um, I'm going to be reading some sections from this, uh, both some of the poetry and also some of the insights that the math professor, who is also a poet, uh, had to say. Um, and I'll just kind of skip around the page of the highlighted sections. There are many ways in which poetry and mathematics can be linked. One way is to view mathematical concepts and insights as a metaphor for life, and vice versa. Indeed, life and mathematics can make fascinating dual metaphors. Math research in itself represents a quest for knowledge of the most precise kind. Like any other quest, it can be only partially completed. Does it come as any surprise that it's possible to have emotions about mathematics? And that, for a mathematician, it's possible to have emotions about the process of doing math research or about the math itself? Further, is it possible for a non-mathematician to have emotions which connect with mathematics? Um, and uh, that comes as no surprise to me, to be honest. 
People who have math anxiety need to know that mathematics or mathematics are no, mathematicians rather are not cold or and unfeeling, nor need math be. Even if they themselves do not feel or understand math feelings, it can be helpful for them to see that others do. Um, and actually, that's what I'm hoping to do here. If any uh, any writing person happens to watch this online, I want to show show them that uh, math is indeed beautiful. Um, it can be used. Um, here we see numbers as people. I, the, the word is one that I know I'm not going to be able to spit out right now. I have it written on the page. <laughs> um, there is a sibling rivalry between this conjecture and its negation. And I, poor mother, throw up my hands. Anything, anything, whatever you decide, just please hurry up and make up your minds. Um, and here we see again, um, this is her actual motherhood um, as opposed to simply a metaphor. Today, Kevin, Devin catches me at it. Mommy, what are you trying to do? Oh, I say, well, these lines. I'm trying to fix these lines. And then I explain triangles, and then I explain transitive. Sometimes it can't be done, I tell him, and other times it can. I'm trying to figure out when it can. I get it, he says. I get it, Mommy. And later he catches me at it again. That one worked, right? Because maybe if that one worked, we could go play Parcheesi, or cards, or ice cream. Or at least Mommy won't keep staring at these lines. Um, and as a note, uh, I'm not a poet. I don't consider myself to be. Uh, I don't really have the ability to judge the quality of these poems. Um, I am going to plug Esther for a moment. Um, <laughs> if you guys haven't picked up a, a, the most recent copy of the Display Magazine, she does have about six poems published in it, um, and they're really, really good. So, um, you know, if you're more on the poetry side of things, check that out for sure. Um, and here, the author has some more insight. It's possible for a mathematician to have emotions about or recollections of math while not doing math. Of course, it varies with the individual, but it happens often. The following poems attempt to describe a mathematician's view of the world, or perhaps even a non-mathematician's sometimes mathematical view of the world. And I chose one of these in this section to read that I thought was quite interesting. When I leave the house in the morning, cats can't lock me out. Cats, ca cats can't even follow me into the vestibule. Cats can only stay behind the glass YZ plane as I move further into the rain. And when I come home and ring the bell, cats can't run to let me in. Cats can only bounce around the first octant, buzz, shiver, sizzle, and shriek as I fumble inside my purse so bleak. And if I fall asleep, reading cats can only lie down next, beside me, sleeping with me in too much glare in the lonely king-sized unit square. Um, and I'll end with this final insight. Mathematicians sometimes say that the attraction to math is order. However, even when order does not result from mathematical work, there can still be an attraction. Perhaps the mere quest for order, which math always provides, can be enough. I not only agree with that, I plan to show that in my next example. Probably shouldn't misplace this. Um, and uh, Professor Dirsch, I know you'll be recognizing a couple of things that you've sent me in the past, um, this in particular. Um, so I think that Michael Frame in, in this piece does have a similar mindset. Um, he is ruminating on, um, in, in the section I'm going to be reading, he's mainly ruminating on grief and thinking about it very mathematically, um, which I think is something that a lot of us do. Um, but I thought this was an interesting insight. I'll see if I can read it in a way that's going to come through. Loss signals a discontinuity, an abrupt break. To visualize the situation, we'll need to simplify to focus on a few pieces of our mental representation. Here's an experiment to guide us. Stand under a bright light. I'm hoping I can do this on the, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I can do this on the projector. And hold your left hand horizontally with your fingers spread. Forgive me, it's my right hand. Um, with your right hand, Hold a pad of paper horizontally under your left hand. The shadows of your finger should be widely separated. Now tilt your left hand. Depending on the angle of the tilt, if you can see the shadow at all, um, just step forward. Uh, depending on the angle of the tilt, the shadows of your fingers get closer together. The magnitude of the discontinuity can stand for the emotional weight of the irreversible change. Certainly, some losses have a larger impact than others. The different tilts of your hand represent projections to different spaces that is, to focusing our attention on different aspects of our lives. So if we can find an appropriate way to focus our attention, we can reduce the magnitude of the discontinuity and thus blunt the pain of grief. To fill in a bit more detail, think of all the dimensions that describe your life. 
Start with the obvious ones, three space coordinates, longitude, latitude, and altitude, and time. Then think of your emotional state. Where are you on the happy-sad axis, on the comfortable-anxious axis, and so on? At any moment, you are described by a point in the very high-dimensional space that characterizes your mental state. If visualizing the space is a problem, just think of it as a list of all the attributes of your state of mind. As time progresses, you trace out a path in this space, a path through this list. The discontinuity of an irreversible change is seen as a jump, a break in this path. And um, if this is a little bit hard to understand, um, I, uh, I'm going to invoke my psychology knowledge here uh, and reference the ocean personality test. It's the most common personality test used by psychologists. Anybody who, uh, any psychologist that I know is very snotty about the pop psychology ones. Um, but essentially, you have five personality traits, each of which, which have six different facets, I believe. Is it six facets? Yeah. Um, and on each one, there's a continuum of like lower to higher. Um, and you know, we kind of take them together and we average them out to, to figure out, uh, OK, out of using these facets, how do we know how much of this trait we have um, or, or how, how high we are? Um, and basically, that's what um, Frame is trying to get you to do here, is consider those. Um, and then consider those, instead of as bars, uh, consider those as axes um, going in different directions. There's a, it is very high dimensional, um, which is why I haven't attempted to draw it. At any moment, you can't attend to all these coordinates, all the components of your emotional, physical, and intellectual state. You are aware or not of your position in the entire space, but of only a projection, a shadow on a much lower dimensional space. This lower dimensional space is a list of those aspects of your life that hold your attention at the moment. I think I must have my email open over there. I might have to shut that. <laughs> Return to the image of the shadow of your hand. With the, well, it's probably going to be a left tilt. Um, with a, a tilt of your hand, the space between the shadows of your fingers can disappear completely. Well, if I can get it right. Um, but I th this, I think, we do not want to do. For f I fear that removing grief would also remove love. I am not willing to live a life without love in order to be spared the furious incandescence of grief. We may salve the pain, but we should never delete it. How are we to find an effective projection? Here again, geometry can help. As far as I can tell, while griefs differ in magnitude, at a fundamental level, they are similar. Moreover, each grief is made of many smaller griefs, which in turn are made of still smaller griefs. Grief is self-similar. It is fractal. How does this help? It goes on to explain, essentially, that we should have that tilt, that projection. I'm going to kill this while I talk. Um, Math lab is popping off over here, um, as usual. OK, let me get back to here. Oops. Current slide. All right. He goes on to explain, essentially, that you want a projection that allows you to feel enough that you can act on it, but not enough to paralyze you. Um, and he ends with this thought. Geometry has shown me this about grief. Focus on one aspect, this is the projection. Find a way to push that out into the world and apply the same strategy for all aspects of grief. Geometry has shown me that grief is a license for action. It was pretty abstract, but one thing that I know about this post, and I would assume about his book um, that this was adapted from, is that he is giving directly, um, he's explaining directly what the metaphor is. That stands in stark contrast to the lyric essay. Instead of explaining um, what an, a, the essay is just trying to get you to understand, um, it typically works through association and juxtaposition. Um, so I've gathered this list from my, uh, really the Blackboard site, um, for my advanced creative nonfiction class. And uh, to be quite honest, it can be hard to understand what a lyric essay is exactly until you've read multiple and, and perhaps written one or two. Um, but they're made up of these four characteristics. Um, the form mirrors or informs the content. We see this a lot with uh, hermit crabs. Um, a hermit crab it, essay is essentially where you take a form um, and then you make it, uh, you make sure that, you, that the reader ends up knowing at a certain point that the form is a misdirect of some sort. Um, so a lot of people will write about um, something perhaps in the form of a recipe. Um, really good example of something that could work with that would be a 
person writing about the, perhaps their grandmother who made a lot of um, really good you know, uh, treats for them as a child um, and they've recently lost. Um, juxtaposition, and it works through juxtaposition and association rather than reflection. That's what I was just talking about here, where Michael Frame is reflecting. He is talking about what he's learned, he's talking about his thought process, and he's directly stating the connection between things. Um, the lyric essay is different, and we'll look at one published example and then um, also my own essay to kind of see how that works out. Um, it has poetic qualities rather than fiction. Uh, techniques typically. Um, once again, there's there's some fluctuation in that, but a lot of it is very like evocative language, a lot of um, a lot of metaphor, and leaning in a little bit to the ambiguity of the situation. Um, and finally, the reader participates in the meaning making. Um, that is hard to pull off, uh, but this can be done by the author leaving in kind of little Easter eggs. Um, and the reader can, or, or, or pieces that can be ambiguously interpreted as one thing or, or something else entirely. Um, and once again, I, I did adapt this from the instructions on a discussion board post for my, <laughs> for my class because I didn't really want to look up another thing. Um, so I'm going to be looking at an example here. And this is one that also uses math. Actually, it's very similar to my own essay in that it uses uh, math and associations, typically more association than juxtaposition, to discuss um, the experience of chronic pain. Um, it's actually, was, my essay was heavily inspired by this one. Um, and for this, the author is using multiple different uh, tactics to kind of surround the issue. Um, and I think that part of, part of what that's doing is showing just how complex and, and uh, um, easy to escape explanation chronic pain can be. Um, so the threads are the pain scale itself, um, obviously in the title, um, and the experience of pain, which you would expect. There's a lot of um, mathematics in here as well. Um, it's not highly organized and it's just kind of, here's a mathematical idea and here's another one. Um, and I think that the association happens not only between the threads but among them as well. Um, the uh, Beaufort scale for wind, I found that interesting. Um, I think that was actually a quite appropriate one. And then Dante's Inferno. Um, and the essay works through the association of the topics and it weaves in a cohesive narrative about the experience of chronic pain without trying to trap it into a pretty little box. And that's where, um, that's where I actually think that this essay here, the pain scale has a, has a slight advantage over Michael frames because he is putting it into a box. He's saying, this is how it works and this is how it works and here's what I've learned. This one um, thing that I've learned about grief from geometry, as opposed to um, Eulabis here, is using um, all of these different threads to show almost the hopelessness of capturing the experience. Um, and I'm gonna be talking a little bit in a minute about how she uses the math after I read this section. It begins with, with zero. Um, it works go, going from zero to 10. The concept of Christ is considerably older than the concept of zero. Both are problematic. Both have their fallacies and their immaculate conceptions. But the problem of zero troubles me significantly more than the problem of Christ. I am sitting in an exam room of a hospital entertaining the idea that absolutely no pain is not possible. Despite the commercials, I suspect that pain cannot be eliminated. And this may be the fallacy on which we have based all our calculations and all our excesses. All our sins are for zero. Zero is not a number, or at least it does not behave like a number. It does not add, subtract, or multiply like other numbers. Zero is a number in the way that Christ was a man. Aristotle, for one, did not believe in zero. If no pain is possible, then, another question. If no, is no pain desirable? Does the absence of pain equal the absence of everything? Um, here she's, I'm gonna skip a little bit. I'm not a mathematician, clearly. I'm sitting in a hospital trying to measure my pain on a scale from zero to 10. For this purpose, I need a zero. A scale of any sort needs fixed points. The upper fixed point on the Fahrenheit scale, 96, is based on a slightly inaccurate measure of normal body temperature. The lower fixed point, zero, is the coldest temperature in which a mixture of salt and water can remain liquid. I, myself, am a mixture of salt and water. I strive to remain liquid. I'm not really sure where she's getting the uh, Fahrenheit scale having an upper 
fixed point of 96, uh, if I'm being honest. Um, but I think what you can see here is a very different attitude toward math. Um, she's careless, uh, quite, in um, her uh, explanations of the mathematical concepts. And she also admits to not being a mathematician, and yet she's using it to describe this. And uh, she goes on later, and I didn't mark out um, the part of this essay, but she does explain later that she began to get to a point where she failed to understand math. Um, and so to her, math is stressful, um, and it doesn't provide any comfort. And with that, um, it comes off as very uh, you know, stressed out and trying to understand pain as well as she's trying to understand math. Um, I actually meant to put that slide up before. And there's just one more piece of this that I'm going to use to lead into my own essay. It's just one little sentence here. We have reason to believe in infinity, but everything we know ends. And I looked at this line and I thought, um, I disagree. So my title is Scales and Games with Endless Numbers. Um, I have written this for my advanced creative nonfiction class at GVSU. Um, that class is actually ending next week. I have to turn in my portfolio and my finalized pieces and, uh, on Monday. And so um, there will probably be some more editing over the, the next you know, few days. Uh, I tend to, tend to do that. Um, but I was able to kind of cut it down into an abridged version that I'll be spending most of the rest of the time reading out. Um, I constructed this based on our discussion of ghost text. So my professor brought up this, this subject and she said, hey, we've got this, uh, we've got this essay that we're going to read here. Um, and the title referred to it being um, uh, an allusion to Moby Dick. Um, and you could see in the style of that writing um, how it was kind of related. Um, the, the fun thing that existed here was uh, Moby Dick obviously is about this huge whale. And the, the thing that, um, or the, I suppose the, the creature, if you want to anthropomorph, ugh, I can't even say it. Um, if you want to um, make that association is a rubber duck that was spilled, um, or multiple rubber ducks that were spilled in the ocean at one point. Um, and it was, there had some very interesting craft elements. But all I could think about when my professor mentioned a ghost text was, I really want to write an essay about my experience with chronic pain that uses math. And the association that I made right away in my brain was the Colette's conjecture. So I actually started this, um, this, the process of writing this essay by doing the calculations. Um, I started at 100 and I decided to go back to 1. Um, and you'll see why in a minute, um, I, or why, that I, why I chose that. Um, I did all the calculations, kind of wrote it out, spent probably three hours uh, one night just, just kind of working on it. And by the time that I got to the end of those calculations, I thought, I have some ideas. So I'm going to go ahead and read this version. Um, and I'm going to be. I'm going to be discussing some ways that you guys can access the, the full length um, version of the essay in a minute um, once I've finished this. But I'm just going to read this section that basically takes all of the math and it cuts out a lot of the non-mathematical sections. I needed to shorten it for time, but I also needed to shorten it um, because I wasn't super comfortable reading um, the level, level of vulnerability uh, that I, I put into this essay out loud. Um, however, I'm still willing to share that with you guys um, at the end here. So I'm going to get myself comfortable here. Here we go. When you go into surgery, they have you count backward from 100 as the anesthesia kicks in. 100, 99, 98. And usually you'll be out by the time you get to 95. At least, that's what it's like in the movies. I wouldn't know. I've never had surgery. Last March, I met with a neurosurgeon to discuss the possibility of surgery on my spinal cord. My recent MRIs had shown two thin syrinxes, which were cerebrospinal fluid filled cysts at the center of the spinal cord. And if Google was correct, those syrinxes explained everything. Surgery to drain the fluid would be highly invasive and require months of recovery, but if it went well, I could be nearly symptom free afterwards. For the first time in years, ever since the pain crept in slowly at the age of 13, there was hope. Once this nightmare was over, maybe a year or two down the road, I'd just be a normal 20-something, pursuing my dreams and feeling okay for the first time that I could remember. 
But none of that happened. After I'd waited three hours for my appointment, trying to do homework in the waiting room as the weight of my future sat heavy on my chest, the neurosurgeon took one look at my MRI and told me the syrinxes were too small to be causing any symptoms at all. The appointment lasted five minutes. Back to square one. When I'm awake at night, sometimes I try to count backward from 100. I want to fool my body into thinking it is being anesthetized, but I always get distracted. When I was a child, I counted primes. When I got bored of that, I counted them in Roman numerals, then in Roman numerals in sign language. But now, I find myself passing the numbers through the 3n plus 1 algorithm. If the number is odd, multiply by 3 and add 1. This gives an even number. If the number is even, divide by 2. The Colette's conjecture states that the algorithm will always bring the number back to 1, or when continued past the point of 1, a 4 to 1 loop. The path it takes to get there, however, may be quite a ride. And I thought about this, and I think I want to just write that equation over here. Um, I should have asked for an eraser, but I think we'll do. Um, essentially, it's this. Um, if n is odd, is even. Bye bye, too. Thank you. Appreciate that. Just want to have this over here for reference um, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, which I assume most of you probably are. Um, and then you simply repeat until we get to one. So instead of counting backward from 100 directly, I put each number through the Colette's algorithm. 100, 50, 25, 76, 34, 17, 52, 26, 13, 40, 20, 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. It works. So I keep going. 99, 298, 149, 448, 224, 112, 56, 28, 14, 7, 22, 11, 34, 17, 52, 26, 13, 40, 20, 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Because 3n plus 1 turns an odd number even, the next step is always divide by 2. What goes up must come down. I imagine that pain must be like this too, temporary. Increase must always be followed by decrease. A decrease may never re restore me to my pre-increase state, but it is, nonetheless, a decrease. I continue. 98, 49, 148, 74, 37, 112, 56, 28, 14, 7, 22, 11, 34, 17, 52, 26, 13, 40, 20, 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. And then I reach 97. That one's a doozy. For instance, or for reference, the graphical representation of the path that 97 takes to get down to 1 looks something like this. I'm calculating it, but I suddenly realize it's begun to loop. It's not supposed to loop until it gets to 1. Something is wrong. I recalculate, but it's following the same path. I worry I won't ever be, bring it back down again. The Colette's conjecture has not been proven. Every case up to, to 2 to the 28th power works, according to software designed to brute force countless calculations. Additionally, Rio Terrace pr proved in 1976 that the Colette's conjecture holds for almost all numbers, a result that sounds disappointing to any non-mathematician, but is, despite the apparent imprecision of this explanation, a significant result. But the question of whether it always will, for any number, has yet to be answered. I think about that now, and in my pain-addled brain, I wonder if somehow 97 has been missed as a counterexample. I continue my calculations, my heart sinking as the numbers climb higher and higher, until finally they start to fall. Slowly, oh so slowly. And now, after 118 steps, we are back to one. I can handle just about anything, as long as I know it's temporary. That's why I get such a thrill out of the 3n plus 1 algorithm. Even in cases like 97, when the numbers soar as high as 9,232 9, before dropping, rising again, dropping again, I know it'll come back to one. Somehow. It might be hell to get there, but I know it will happen eventually. The Colette's conjecture was proposed first by Lothar Colitz in 1937, two years after he received his doctorate. He was only 27, not that much older than I am now. 
I wonder if he, like I do, felt every so often that he was running out of time. I keep calculating. 96 is easy. I'm going to put this back to a less distracting thing here. 96, 48, 24, 12, 6, 3, 10, 5, 16, 8, 4, 2, 1. Encouraged, I move on to 95. 95, 286, 143, 430, 215, 646, 323, 970. This isn't looking promising. But as I go, I see a familiar number, 364. And I realize the rest of the sequence can be borrowed from my calculations on 97. There is familiarity. Though there are 94 more numbers in the sequence after 364, I already know what they are. There is safety in these numbers. Uh, 94, eight steps to get to 98, which I've already calculated. 25 more steps to get to one. 93, three steps to get to 70, which I saw in previous calculations. 14 more steps to get to one, easy. I've already seen 92 show up while calculating 97. 17 steps to get to one. I've seen 91 as well, unfortunately. It makes up the bulk of 97 sequence. But still, despite the fact that the numbers soar close to 10,000 before slowly, haltingly returning to one, I know the path it will take. It is familiar, safe. And we have 90. 90, 45, 136, 68, 34. Repeat, 13 more steps to one. 89, 268, 134, 67, 202, 101, 304, 152, 76, 38, 19, 58, 29, 88, 44, 22, 11, 34. Repeat, 13 more steps to one. 88, repeat, 17 steps to one. And so it continues. I piggyback off the work I've already done. So much of the work is not new, yet I write every number relishing in its familiarity. What goes up must come down. It will always come back to one. I care less about my computations as I go. Rather than seeking one, I seek the familiar number that I know will lead to one, and I let the algorithm si simply do the rest. Is this apathy? Is this giving up? Mathematicians are discouraged from working on the Collette's conjecture at all. Some believe it is an unsolvable problem. We will never be certain, some claim. We can't find a counterexample, but it may be unprovable. 20th century Hungarian mathematician Paul Erdos stated, referring to the Collette's conjecture, that mathematics may not be ready for such problems. We can trust it. It works for any number that we could possibly care about, if indeed we care about the algorithm for individual cases at all. Yet we can't trust it entirely because it remains unproven. There are two types of counterexamples that could prove the Collette's conjecture wrong. One would be a number which shoots off into infinity, never to return. The other would be a number that eventually forms a closed loop other than 4 to 1. Neither have ever been found. Every, ex every example tested has acted as expected. 60 become, takes three steps to become familiar. 59, two. 58 is familiar. So are 57, 56, 55, 54. 54 takes two steps. So does 53. 52 is familiar. Statistical analysis is useful for understanding how numbers going through this algorithm eventually return to one. 3n plus one increases each odd number more than dividing by two it decreases it. But every odd number immediately becomes even after 3n plus one while not every even number becomes odd by dividing by two. Some numbers smoothly divide by two, uninterrupted by a single odd number until they reach one. On average, each step of the algorithm multiplies the number by a factor of three quarters, which is less than one. Thus, on average, the number is always decreasing. This comprises the heuristic argument that the Collette's conjecture is indeed true. But averages mean little on such a small scale. They also prove nothing, much to the disappointment of disillusioned mathemat mathematicians around the world. Mathematicians who would love to solve this mystery subdue the algorithm, tame the beast. But the Collatz conjecture submits to no one, and neither does pain. 51 takes five steps to return to the familiar. 50 is familiar. 49 takes one step. 48, five. 47, two. The three n plus one algorithm is erratic. It is unpredictable, unreliable, and yet somehow always, by a non-mathematical definition of the word always, manages to descend to one. I think that's why it so fascinates me. The unpredictability of each step is easily ignored when the certainty of the final result can be obtained. 46 becomes familiar in one step. 45 and two. 44 is familiar. 43, one. 42, two. 41, four. When I begin each day, I know I will also end it. What I will suffer in between now and then remains to be seen. But I will reach the end, and I will crawl into bed, and maybe sleep, probably sleep, eventually sleep. Every day this happens. 
I trust this pattern. It has always worked before. I have tested it on 8,353 8, days so far. Some days, it seems less certain than others. Certainly the day my car was T-boned by a pickup truck tested my trust in this pattern far more than other days, but it holds. Unlike the Collatz conjecture, however, this pattern is proven to break. One day I will begin a day that I will not end. Maybe the 8,354th case will break the pattern. Maybe 8,354 is my limit. Yet I continue to trust instinct, instinctually that it is not, and it will not, and that I will end tomorrow and the next day and the day after that. I depend a lot more on this pattern that is pr proven to break than I do on a conjecture that may very well be always true. Someday it will end, but not today, or so I trust. There is nothing new under the sun, or at least under 40. Everything is immediately familiar. The numbers ascend and descend in their erratic patterns, but I know them and I trust them. They all come down to one, every time. Down, down, down they go. There is nothing new to be said about pain. It's all been said before. When I trace the numbers on paper, I am relieved to be nearing the end. But when I am counting backward to lull myself to sleep, hitting five makes me nervous. I am running out of numbers. I am running out of time to fall asleep. I am not anesthetized. I will have to start over, perhaps higher, 1,000 maybe, to give myself enough material to ponder. But even in spite of this, I find the narrowing down of each number comforting. They approach one as their paths growing simpler. Five, 16, eight, four, two, one. Four, two, one. Three, 10, five, 16, eight, four, two, one. Two, one. And yet, even when they reach one, the p pattern need not end. It loops, and it can loop forever if need be. One, four, two, one. Four, two, one. Four, two, one. Four, two, one. And I did have a couple of ways that you guys can access the, uh, um, the uh, uh, full essay, um, because that was about half of the essay, and it's more on the math section. So I, I printed out a whole bunch of QR codes. I'll pass those out during question time. Um, if you don't have a way to scan the code, um, I also brought about 10 printed copies, um, which, I mean, there's less than 10 of you, so you guys can all have a printed copy, actually. Um, and then the website link will also be added to the math seminars page of the GRCC website, at, you know, as long as that happens. I'm going to end here with just one more little section, which is the last page of this book. Um, and I'm going to briefly uh, just say that the, the other thing that brings um, Root and the professor in this book together is um, their... Uh, is, is their love of, of baseball. And the, the professor's favorite player, who by this point has long since retired, but he doesn't know that because he's you know, lost his memory, is uh, named Anatsu. Um, and uh, that'll come up in a minute. Our last visit to the professor was in the autumn of the year root tw turn 22. Did you know that you can divide all the prime numbers greater than two into two groups? He was sitting in a sunny spot, pencil in hand. There was no one else in the lounge, and people who passed by the door from time to time seemed far away. We listened carefully to the professor. If n is a natural number, then any prime can be expressed as either 4n plus 1 or 4n minus 1. It's always one or the other. All of those numbers, those infinite primes, can all be divided into two groups. Take 13, for example. That would be 4 times 3 plus 1, Root said. That's right. And 19? 4 times 5 minus 1. Exactly, the professor nodded. And there's more to it. The numbers in the first group can always be expressed as a sum of two squares, but those in the second can never be. So 13 equals 2 squared plus 3 squared? Precisely, said the professor. His joy had little to do with the difficulty of the problem. Simple or hard, the pleasure was in sharing it with us. Root passed the qualifying exam to become a middle school teacher. Next spring, he'll begin teaching mathematics. I could hardly contain my pride as I made my announcement. The professor sat up to hug Root, but his arms were frail and trembling. Root bent down to embrace him, the Anatsu card hanging between them. It's a baseball card. The sky is dark. The spectators and the scoreboard are in shadow. Anatsu stands alone on the mound under the stadium lights, the windup, the pitch. Beneath the visor of his cap, his eyes follow the ball, willing it over the plate and into the catcher's mitt. It is the fastest one he has ever thrown, and I can just see the number on the back of his pinstriped uniform. The perfect number, 28. And uh, just put my references up here. Any questions from you guys? I'm going to go ahead and pass these out, actually. 
You can all have a copy. I apologize um, as I try to print them correctly. Didn't do a very good job. Oh, you're passing them out? Okay. I was like, why are you coming up here? You can chase me down. <laughs> yeah. The tech savvy among us. The tech savvy among us who prefer, yes. All right. Yeah. Oh, back. Yes. Hmm? Oh, yeah, Carl, sorry. <laughs> First, but Carl, so when did you first hear about this projector? Um, so I actually saw a thumbnail of a YouTube video. Um, I think it was probably during my f the first summer of COVID. And it said, the, the simplest math problem no one can solve. Um, I think it was by, I, can't, I think it might have been by Veritasium. Um, and I saw 3x plus 1 on it. And I was like, I have to see this. And so I watched it, and that's kind of what put that idea in my head. And actually, I found out later. Um, so uh, my youngest sister is not into math, um, but I found out later that she actually watched it so that she could tell me about it. Um, and I was like, I watched that video. She's very disappointed, but I was like, no, I appreciate the fact that you watched a math video for me. That is, that is the way to show me love. But you had already watched it. I had, yes. But I was like, you know, I guess it, uh, it's, you know, it's making the algorithm. Um, it's, uh, it's doing well, so. It's encouraging to hear. No. Chance? I actually have two questions. Mm -hmm. So first of all, why did you choose why did you choose the collapse conjecture instead of like another uh, like unsolved problem in math? Is it because it was so simple and seemed like something that was simple that couldn't be solved or it's because it's 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 a it holds all the mystery of any unsolved math problem, but it's easy to explain to non mathematicians. So I wrote this obviously in a writing class. Um, and not a single other person in this class was interested in math, um, but I was still able to kind of make that connection um, that, that made sense to them um, because it's just really easy to explain. Okay, so, nice. and then your second, second question. My second question, do you think it will ever be solved? Like a definitive thing will be, will be proven out You're asking the wrong person here. I had a math minor. What is your opinion? My opinion, <laughs> my opinion is that in a long time, the, the, the field of mathematics will make enough progression. Um, and I, probably technology will as well. Um, and I think that there will eventually be an answer. It might be, it might be in a, quite a while, though. <laughs> like a number like greater than 2 to the, what was it, like 2 to the 28th? 2, two to the 68th, I believe, yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Which, I mean, 2 to the 68th itself is easy, but any number <laughs> around it, I, I don't even want, I, I don't even want to think about it, to be honest. All right. And you still had a question. I, I have a question, just an observation. The question is, you said that the collapse conjecture holds for almost all numbers. Can you infer that a little bit? What does hmm. almost all numbers mean? I read a Wikipedia article. <laughs> That's about all I got, unfortunately. Yes. Well, it comes off as that, but there is a there is a proof, and I don't know what the proof is exactly. I don't know how it works. Um, if you're in analysis, if something holds almost everywhere, that means it holds except on a set of measures zero. If you're talking about the natural numbers, that doesn't make any sense. So I'm just curious if if you could send me a reference on that, I'd like to see what that means. I'll 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 do some digging. Um, I will definitely do that. Um, an observation, you are, you are someone who has a vast number of interests, and I don't know where you're going to end up in your career, but if you ever teach, you need to teach Math 124, which is our Math for Liberal <laughs> Arts, and you need to do that because you have the perfect mindset for that. I taught that course many times and I loved it, mm -hmm. but I, I'm too narrowly focused in m the math and mm -hmm. some of the sciences. My understanding of literature is essentially zero. Fair enough. You could bring a lot to a course like that. So, it, and, and mm -hmm. it doesn't, you know what? You could be one of those wonderful people who maybe ends up teaching psychology or English, but you could say, I want to teach a math class. That is my hope, actually. And uh, it's funny you bring that up, because I didn't ever get a chance to actually teach a class here. Um, but originally, um, Dana offered me a uh, Math 99 class, because that's kind of what he saw. Um, and so 
certainly uh, something apparently a lot of you guys can see. Um, I appreciate that. Tell him, Dersh, that you should teach a 1.2, and then him immediately get <laughs> well, like, except he won't be department head anymore in about a week and a half. So, <laughs> I think I know, missed that news. Better hurry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I'm going to have to wait until next summer. Yeah. Any other? Oh, hi. <laughs> Uh, I'll be taller if it helps. Um, <laughs> did you come across any? Uh, did you come across any commentary on um, the mathematics in poetry in things like syllable counts, line breaks, cadences, uh, number of letters? Did you come across any of that while you were looking at the poetry piece of this? So I didn't because I remembered the poetry piece, um, and I don't think that Professor Durst sent it to me directly, but I think. Um, I think you sent me like a, you know, she made a comment somewhere on some forum, and then I dug up this article, and I really just read that. Um, I didn't, I didn't see a lot about the actual like precision of the poetry. I focused a lot less on the poetry in this yeah. in this talk, given that that's very much not my genre. Um, but it's a, it's a good. I just like, I like how much math is in the poetry, and it was fun to it was fun to hear some of the more abstract versions. But there's also the concrete as well, so it's it's mm -hmm. like a fun mishmash. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions, comments? <laughs> um, and I, I will note, by the way, the the um, essay that you have in your hand is where it is currently. Um, again, I, I'm turning it in in about five days, and I'm probably going to still add some more sections and potentially kind of tidy it up, cut out a few things. Um, so if you ever see this published in a literary magazine somewhere, which I'm sure all of you read many of those, um, then d don't be surprised if there's some significant changes being made. But that's just what I wanted to share today. All right? All right thank you very much. Mm -hmm.